I'm April Dawn Scheffler, and I invite you to play with me and my guest today. Welcome, Keita. Is it Keita? You got it. <laughs> it's a 50-50 it's a chance people are going to get the name right. You totally know. Well, my chances were helped because I think I saw where you at one place had put the pronunciation. It's Kate and then uh, at the end. <laughs> But I am going to need help on your last name. So for our listeners, could you pronounce your last name for us as well? Yes. And I'll preface this by saying my, my husband still says that I pronounce it wrong. Oh. So <laughs> this is open for debate, but I call my last name Mrazek. I think he says it's Mrazek. Well, in this segment, we pop into a virtual coffee house before hitting the beach. And being the benevolent host that I am, your order's on me. So what order do you give the barista? Ooh, I'm going to order like a fancy mocha with reishi and adaptogens and all the, all the things. Nice. <laughs> I love <laughs> Lion's it. Mane. <laughs> do you drink the mushroom coffee? I mean, not regularly, but, but when somebody's going to treat me. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I was using Four Sigmatic for a while. They had mm -hmm. some great mushroom coffees. And then here recently I've been doing the uh, La Republica, um, mm. their deca decaf mushroom coffees. So yeah, I like nice. this too. Anything that I think of as a treat while at the same time making me smarter, it's like, <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> yeah. I try to make most things in my life feel like that at this point. Yeah. I don't like to restrict myself. I like to have treats, but I like for them to be supporting other goals besides just feeling treated. Mm, I love that. So if that comes up later on, on in our conversation, I think I would like to hear more about that. Ways that you're able to incorporate that because sure. Um, yeah. I want to, I want to do more of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now that you have your refreshing beverage, what I was thinking about, and we can fast forward this for the listeners and watcher, but do you mind if I draw an Oracle card for, for us? No, it sounds fun. And this was, I had a birthday recently and I have like the best friends. I was gifted the spirit animal Oracle by Colette Baron reed and I love it. So... Let's see what, what our animal guide for this session is. Usually I would just kind of shuffle through them with my hands and just kind of stop whenever I had this expansive feeling in my heart. But I've been experimenting with something recently. A friend had said that she was using her pendulum and she hadn't really gotten the pendulum to work for her before. And I was able to resonate with that because my pendulum really wouldn't work with me either. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so it was a little frustrating, but she said that she would use the pendulum to pick the cards and how it worked. And so I tried it myself and I think, I think it worked really beautifully last couple of times I've mm. tried it. So let's set our intention of... The message that can best guide our conversation today. Okay, maybe it's, <laughs> it's like swinging like crazy, but it's not really. Oh, I was waiting for the swelling feeling. I, fe I felt it both times in the same spot. Do you want me to tell you and see if you can feel it? Yeah, tell me. Okay, so keep moving it. I'll, I'll just check if I still feel it. It's right around there. You feel anything? I can feel a, a swelling in my heart. Yeah, that's okay. Now it's shifting to frontward and backward. So let's mm. see where it narrows down to. Right okay. there. Yeah, I can feel that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome how that works. Okay, I love this co creative thing. <laughs> we have bat spirit. A rebirth is assured. Hmm. So do you have any associations with the bat? Not really, except that we moved to Austin, Texas about a year ago, and there's the famous bat bridge. <laughs> I will tell you that my husband and I, we went to Austin and rented a, well, actually, we either rented a kayak or took our own, but 
I thought it would be so romantic and relaxing for us to kayak down the river. And maybe for some couples, it would be. <laughs> but for the two of us who are very strong personalities, it was not, <laughs> it was not good. Because for one thing, we're not regular kayakers. And so it was more of him like, no, do it like this. <laughs> I'm like about to hit him with it when we were, it was all said and done. So the opposite of it being romantic, it was like, oh gosh, we almost killed each other. <laughs> <laughs> what number is this? This is number five. And I have said in other podcasts that five is one of my favorite numbers because in numerology, it symbolizes change and adventure and kind of has that Uranian aspect to it of something different coming up. Mm. There is a lot of words to this. After something has run its course and died or been released, finished, surrendered, completed, or ended, there is a promise of a new beginning. Rebirth is assured just as night gives way to dawn and the bat emerges from the darkness of a womb-like cave. Bat spirit has come to remind you that this rebirth is a miraculous one. For the very best elements, okay, I was going to talk, we're going to talk about elements later. For the very best elements of what you had to give up in the death of the old are still present in this new amazing life forming now. This is the miracle and magic of rebirth in every aspect of your life, including the rebirth of faith in your ability to establish new and healthy relationships. <clears throat> Bat spirit reminds you that at present you are in unknown territory and may feel as if you are lost. However, you are called to trust that your intuition will be a reliable guide as you give birth to something new and unfamiliar. Bat spirit has listened in the darkness of night and has heard all your hopes and dreams, your fears and worries, and assures you that this new version of your dream, this move from darkness into light, from lost to found, and death to rebirth, comes to fruition with love at its core. That spirit asks you to trust that what seems to have died is actually shape-shifting into something more meaningful and wondrous than before. If you feel you are in the dark, know that come morning, all will be revealed and things will be in a new form that is right for you. If it is a protection message, it's asking, what are you refusing to let die? Bat spirit is gently nudging you to let go of your need to cling to the familiar story that has already run its course. A new story is poised to be born. Some dreams were only meant to last for a moment in time. Sometimes they were only there to slow you down. Wow, okay. <laughs> oh, that seems like a hard truth being laid down right now. <laughs> Sometimes they were only there to slow you down as you recalibrated in preparation for the new life that will give you what you really want. Oh gosh, I'm feeling that. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps you need to grieve as you say goodbye to something. At least you're saying goodbye to its familiar form. Perhaps you must let go of a part of you that must die so you can be reborn. This temporary time in the dark doesn't have to be scary or sad, though. That spirit gives you her powers of perception and awareness as you learn to listen deeply and navigate these unknown caves of temporary emptiness. You will emerge with a new perspective, and that spirit will witness your giving birth to the life that matches the intentions and desires of your heart and soul. Okay. Okay. I w I'm looking at you and hearing your voice and I'm like, I need to hear your story because it sounded like there were some things in there that really resonated for you or pu pushed something. Time and again, I have gotten Oracle cards that refer to the void or periods of waiting, etc. And with my particular energetic makeup, that's not something I like to do. I know no one does really. Everyone wants instant gratification, but sometimes I just feel as though I'm doing all the, the right things and I'm not seeing the, the end product that culture promises. If you put in the work, you do A, B, you get C, 
But I have also been coming to terms with the fact that my life purpose, it hasn't necessarily been to do anything like crazy over the top. What has come through in hypnosis before was that my purpose was to bring in more fun into the world. <laughs> that and then, yeah, a lot of the things that I've had from Akashic Record readings was that my spirit was just here to have a very individual experience. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> there's been a lot of what I have perceived as periods of waiting or things dying. Yeah. So that just struck me as another thing that waiting or time can do is, I'm just going to read that again. Sometimes they were only there to slow you down as you recalibrated in preparation for the new life that will give you what you really want. I have been realizing here lately that some of the things that I was afraid of such as miscommunication, they have only served as opportunities for like a conversation that wouldn't have come up into form. So like with one of my recent podcast guests, it was embarrassing in that she was saying these same two words over and over again, but I couldn't quite understand it. So rather than at stop and ask her, okay, what are you saying? I took it to mean something else. And Again, it could have been embarrassing, but at the same time, we had this conversation we wouldn't have had if I hadn't have misunderstood her. Or, mm. I've had a couple of more situations like that, so I don't know. I feel like I'm just rambling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking back to when I first connected with you initially and how I think you tested in my quiz as a metal type. Is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I just think that it's it's interesting. One of the characteristics of a metal type is perfectionism mm -hmm. and, and having kind of a really high internal bar for yourself that feels impossible. It does. And I think that all the readings you're getting about having more play and bringing that more into your purpose is a way of swaging the intensity that you seek for yourself. And maybe that's where the, the magic dark or the waiting is something that could become more expansive if you are giving yourself permission to just play within those spaces before you need an outcome. Mm -hmm. But the Enneagram, that's why I identify with the number one, the perfectionist, is not because anything I do looks perfect, but because of that internal dialogue in that bar that you said that we set so high for ourselves. Mm. Yeah. I sometimes I, do, I don't feel like I can really relax even. Yeah. And okay. Before we get into this, <laughs> we have a couple more segments, including the word. I want to go ahead and give you your linguistic tag words Ooh, so you can okay. fit it into our conversation in case that comes up. But first we have the, I think I know you from somewhere segment. Mm. And your spotlight moments, Kata. Have there been any claims to fame, times that our listeners might have seen you or your work? Oh, wow. I, okay, so I will preface this by saying I'm a manifesting generator in human, de it's human design, right? I don't, I haven't looked into it very much, but what I understand of it is like the mangen can look kind of chaotic because they have a lot of things going on at once. Other types like a generator might get nervous that it'll never come to completion, but a mangen makes it all happen. It's just in this kind of messy, intensive kind of way. I'll also say I identify as a fire element type in Chinese medicine, which has a similar energy to it that gets spread out and excited. So anyway, ways that you may have seen me in a spotlight of sorts. I have been a professional dancer and danced with some companies in California and toured the world, but small modern companies. So you may have seen me on Turk CNN in, in Istanbul. <laughs> and I also co-founded an activewear brand called Ghost Flower. And that I think is probably where I would have the most recognition. Uh, I think we were in business I mean, we were working on it for about five years. It just closed its doors last August, 
but that was a brand inspired by Chinese medicine. So it was a way of kind of wearing meridians and acupressure points, and then learning more about traditional Chinese medicine through your own experience and exploration and through fun and wearing clothes. And so that, that became a national brand and was pretty fun. And oh wait, do you have a secret stash of inventory that I could still get some, <laughs> stuff, some stuff from? <laughs> because it sounds pretty cool. It's really cool. And now that it's closed, I'm like, why? So many people now want it. <laughs> I have my own inventory. I have my own stash, but I'm holding on to it because I I'm biased, obviously, but it's the best made active where I've found. It's just really good. In fact, I only wear the ghost flower leggings to this day. I, I don't know if I'll ever buy new leggings again. <laughs> I'll just wear them until they fall apart. But yeah, that, that opened up a lot of avenues where you might've seen me doing different partnerships with people that were more recognizable and things like that. Oh, and I'm also a teacher for a brand that is now known as Lindy Well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an online Pilates teacher for their platform. So that is a way that I get to reach people all over the world with some fun Pilates inspired movement workouts. Very cool. Yeah, this is on a much smaller stage. My daughter will be starting modern this fall. So she's going to be taking, she's taking a pre-point class. And then there was the option of adding modern. And this is the first time I've had that opportunity. And I think that's really where she's going to shine. I'm telling you, like, mm -hmm. since she was three or whenever, and I would just love to sit there and watch her dance to music, just interpret. But I just love... <laughs> I love how her expression comes through in her dance. And to me, I just live vicariously through that. I think it's, it's pretty damn awesome. Actually, I feel like that's a big part of what my interest is now. So I, I didn't start dancing until I was probably 11. I was a gymnast before that. So I started late to the game, but I think that was a little bit better. And I didn't really take it super seriously until I started majoring in it in college. And then I was like, well, you're going to be a professional now. You're committing to this for four years. But I felt like having started later, the value system that I had already developed as a 17, 18 year old was different than what an 11 year old would have. And so there were things like that you're kind of reflecting where I found it to be such an interesting tool for self-expression and artistry and creativity and not necessarily about the virtuosity of it, although that was fun, just being showy and doing tricks, which there's a lot of emphasis on that in some forms of dance. It wasn't the part that I gravitated towards by the time I got to that age. And I feel like even now, even though I teach Pilates and I teach a practice called fascia flossing, which is movement along the meridians and reforming and reworking with your connective tissue, there's this underlying thread for me about empowering people to have permission to have creative expression and to trust the instincts of their body and to break from the normative movement paradigms to find their own freedom through being in a moving body. And I think that that really started when I explored dance as an older young person. The bat, right? It was just this period of time that was creating that space where you might have realized what you really wanted afterwards, or like you said, come to it with a different perspective. But yeah, I love it because I, I think you can see someone's essence come through in several different ways, whether it's writing, you can see like their soul or they write poetry, but with my daughter, yeah, I can just see it shining through the seriousness in her face when she's doing these interpretive dances just mm -hmm. for, for me or for whoever's watching. It's really, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one of my favorite things when my daughter was born, I just brought her with me everywhere. She never took a bottle, which freaked me out a little bit. I was like, where's the freedom? But then I was like, well, I guess she's just coming with me everywhere I go. So I would take her to ballet class and just put a blanket on the floor and she would just wiggle before she could crawl. She'd just listen to the piano and be right by the feet of dancers. And then when I started doing more work with a choreographer and doing some dance films, I would just bring her to the studio and she would be in rehearsal. 
And to this day, when I shoot a film or when I have a rehearsal, I'll often just bring her with and she can play and listen. And, and my choreographer, Robin Bicio, is a wonderful collaborator with me. She will create little nests for my daughter and then give her tool and tutus and things to play with and then find ways to incorporate her into the creative process. And yeah, I just think that's a really nurturing and novel experience. And for young people who are still so open and creative, I think it's just a great time to show them what could be possible or give them permission to, to just explore. Yeah, after we break them in kindergarten, be like, you have to sit in a chair <laughs> and we can give them some more permission. Hey, in these containers, you can actually move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, guests are asked to choose a word or phrase that they would like to hear used more often in everyday conversation, something that doesn't get nearly enough airtime. And our prior guest chose for you the word trust. So you are tasked to try to somehow fit that into our conversation today. Nice. You also get to choose a word for our next guest to dance with, and it could be a peculiar word that you find funny or something that just resonates with you. So what are you laying down for them to pick up? Yeah, I love it. I, also, I almost picked trust as my word, <laughs> but I'm glad I didn't. Refine. Refine. Beautiful. But having known that trust was the word, when we were reading about the bat, it was talking about bat spirit asks you to trust. So now that we've given you your word, I feel like we can really proceed with the rest. Yes. So how you and I met was with Holisticism Hub. And that's going to be no surprise to the listeners. It seems like everyone I've met here recently has been through Holisticism Hub. That is where I'm finding people who are doing the craziest shit. That's amazing. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so fun. I've heard it referred to as unicorns before in that there's people in the spiritual world that combine things that you never would have thought went together. <laughs> So for instance, like just mending clothes and sewing and making that a spiritual practice. So everyone has like their, their niche and turning it into a spiritual practice. So it's just really amazing to find out people who are doing things that you are like, oh, wow, that's a thing. Someone can do that. And it just sparks your creativity for asking yourself, what is it that, that lights my fire? And is there a way that I can bring that to the collective? So you had put out there a quiz and I think I'm not alone in that I'm a sucker for quizzes. I think that's <laughs> just a result of MySpace and Facebook and all these social, social, social media pages. Take a quiz and what's your mm. result? And then you share it with everybody. So I had taken your quiz. Maybe you can introduce the quiz better than I can. Sure. Yeah. So the quiz I made was what is your element type based on Chinese medicine, five elements of Chinese medicine. So if you're familiar with Ayurvedic, it's different than the elements of Ayurveda. We have water, wood, fire, earth, and metal. And the, the types correspond with the seasons, the change in seasons. It also corresponds to different organs in your body that may have a higher energy and personality types, ways that you digest both food, emotions, and your environment. It's just like a test to take it, try it out, and then see if the element resonates with you. Knowing also that we all contain all five of the elements. So you're just seeing which one is kind of presented most. Mm. So can I ask you, how did you get interested in Chinese medicine and, and wisdom? Yeah, well, I'm half Chinese, but I wasn't really that interested in it growing up. I mean, my grandma lived with me for most of my childhood and she had different Chinese remedies that just were kind of around, but I didn't question it. Like you get herbs when you have a cold and you have this type of soup in the winter time and all these different things, but I didn't really pay much attention. Um, but then when I 
started Ghost Flower, which is all based in Chinese medicine. Actually, a client of mine in Pilates was the original founder, and she asked me to come on as a consultant for the movement portion of it. And then as we started going deeper into all of it, I started to really see the wisdom of it and how it, it finally clarified things for me and made sense. There's a wonderful book, Spark in the Machine. It's written by Dr. Dan Keown, who was actually a consultant for us at Ghost Flower. But he's an Eastern medicine doctor, like doctor of Chinese medicine and a Western trained emergency room doctor. And this book is all about describing Chinese medicine in both terms so that it stops feeling so esoteric and mystical and actually for me landed in my body in a way that felt applicable and real. And so from there with Ghost Flower, I just kept developing it and testing out what I was experiencing and observing. And it just felt like this whole new paradigm for understanding people, just like human design, just like astrology, like all of these other things. But for me, it also had this added component of bringing me into my body and using my body to explore and feel. And that's one of the ways that I really understand and translate my experience in the world is through my body as a dancer and a body worker. So you can go to an acupuncturist and get needled and you can start to feel the energy or you can feel things shifting and that's physical. And so that that's the kind of thing I mean. Or now when I do fascia flossing, I can stretch along a meridian and feel an actual biomechanic shift in my human form, but I can also feel how things change for me in my state of mind or in how I'm approaching challenges or how I'm digesting. I just start to see this whole picture. Let me ask you, is there a reason why I might not feel a huge difference with acupuncture? Because I've tried it several times. Is it just maybe the practitioner I'm going to, or is it my, my, my element type that doesn't respond as much, or am I just that horribly disconnected from my body that I'm not <laughs> hearing the signals like, oh, wow, I'm loving this. And I, I just can't hear it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really good question. And I don't think I have an elegant answer for it, but maybe we'll keep talking about it. Cause I'm, sh I know you're not the only person to have that experience. I think that I was that way more before I started exploring it. A placebo effect is called a placebo effect because it actually affects it you. Something. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that my knowledge, my research helped me know where I wanted to focus my attention in those experiences. And so then I could enhance my experience based on the anchors that I was providing for myself. Whereas before, if I had gotten some needles, I'd be like, well, that felt like I took a nice nap. I think I feel better, but I didn't. I didn't have a way of translating the experience into anything that I could hold on to. And so the more I educated myself, the more I felt like I was also able to get more out of these other practices. So that could be one thing. I guess a, a question for you is two questions. Why are you getting acupuncture and, and what value did you see in it to get yeah, it? Yeah, so I was... At, I was basically trying anything and everything for depression was one. And then also I was having horrible insomnia where I couldn't sleep. And so I was hopeful that in addition to a lot of neck tension and back pain, that it would help with that. Okay. Oh. Well, another thought I have, one thing that I gravitated towards with Chinese medicine is that it's a holistic practice. Mm -hmm. So bringing a mindset to it that is more sort of Western oriented, where it's like, I have this symptom and I need you to fix my symptom mm -hmm. is only one tiny part of the whole constellation of your issue. So with Chinese medicine, acupuncture, getting the needles is a very, very small part of it. A real practitioner is going to look at your tongue and listen to your pulse and ask you about your periods and ask you about your diet and ask you about stressors in your life and probably give you herbs. And so it's, it's really trying to approach the whole individual. And so if we just think about one component of it, it might not actually be enough. And also part of what I've been so interested in is trying to expand our awareness of our own ability to heal mm -hmm. 
and empower ourselves to heal through our our knowledge and awareness and trust. There it is. Trust. Mm. <laughs> because if you're like, I have, I have depression, can you take that away from me? Then you're relying on somebody else to do it all for you. When I, I would rather want to create a team of allies to mm. support you to develop what is feeling lacking or give you support so that you can carry that on and, and feel like you are whole without right. them. Mm -hmm. By the way, <laughs> uh, grief, grief is a big emotion that comes in the metal element. It's related to lungs, uh -huh. like old, deep grief. Yeah. I, I carry that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And tears are very cleansing that kind of experience. In fact, I was seeing an acupuncturist yesterday and I'm like, I always have these under eye bags. And she's like, well, some people get those because they don't cry enough. She actually called them unshed tears. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll, I better go have a good cry. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay. So that takes us to the result I got from the quiz. I, I took it and I got metal and I read what the result was talking about. Do you mind if I read that? Sure. What yeah. the result came back with? Okay. I took a screenshot of it. Cool. And, and said it to my favorites. <laughs> nice. Right. It says, you love the finer things in life and are always seeking the best, always improving. Yeah. I feel like everything can be improved. Like there's no finish line. <laughs> <laughs> it's so exhausting. You prefer a minimal, a minimalist approach that is saturated with beauty, symmetry, and purity. You are disciplined and have high moral standards. You thrive on achievement. Be careful. When your metal gets out of balance, you may attach your sense of self-worth to external things like titles and become voracious for signs of your achievement creating a cycle of lowering your inner self-esteem while stacking up accolades on the outside. Okay, I'll just pause there to insert that I have some friends who are like, wow, you accomplished so much. And they set me on this pedestal of doing things that they wish they had the energy or drive to, to do. And so I... I can kind of see what they're talking about because it talks about getting those accolades on the outside, but it, yeah, it just creates that cycle of lowering my inner self-esteem. <laughs> it's, it's vicious. Okay. Mm. Let's resume. To restore harmony, you may enjoy a simple style meditation that focuses solely on the breath. The practice will help you learn to let go and center your focus on the incredible wonder of simply being. And that is so true. I have talked before about going to yoga classes and I don't think it was even the yoga. It was for me mostly just sitting with my breath and I would have those, <laughs> those unshed tears actually make their way. And it was, it was feeling so healing just to sit there on my mat and cry and be thankful that I'm behind everyone else because everyone's looking towards the front and having no idea why I was crying, but it just felt so healing at just to breathe. And this is another rabbit hole, but with the astrology, with the Aries new moon, that kind of starts off the astrological new year with Western astrology, I believe. So they were talking about putting together a vision map, a vision board of what you want. And what I ended up putting on there was this phrase, I do from a place of being. Mm -hmm. And I had kind of gotten that message from a beautiful oracle reading from another holisticism hubber, Carla Luster. She was really gifted and she was able to read into that, that I just needed to do from a place of being. And yeah, a lot of these spiritual practices where you're guided to do this and that with your body, sometimes it doesn't have the same oomph as me just being with myself. <laughs> 
yeah. sometimes I need that container. I need that structure. So it's weird. So let me do nothing, but in a group of people. <laughs> oh, I think you're naming something so powerful. And this has been a hang up of mine lately. I, I went to a yoga class recently. I haven't done yoga in classes in a couple of years because of the pandemic and everything else. And also because I've I felt a little resistance to yoga classes. And when I went there, there was music playing, it was heated. There were all these people doing all these vinyasa flows and their cute tops and their toned bodies. And the guy leading the class was saying all the right spiritual things, but I kind of felt like it was this sort of repackaged distraction from being with ourselves. Yeah. I was like, I don't have room in this class to be with myself. It, it feels like I'm in a space that's trying to put me through so many different stimulus motions that I don't have room to think. And so I feel relief from my thoughts, but that's not really what I need in order to feel grounded and complete. I'm, I'm looking for more space and for a container. I think you need the structure. I think there's power in practicing in a group. Even if you sit and do nothing together, I meditate so much better in a group than alone. Mm -hmm. There's structure and accountability there. And there's also this experience of knowing that you're being witnessed, even if people aren't looking at you right. and that creates significance. So anyway, <laughs> Oh, Some I thoughts. love it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So the fact that you are saying that you felt resistance to yoga classes, that gives me permission to say I brought resistance to your seven days. Yeah. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But basically you had created this quiz as like a, a funnel into your summer curation, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a seven day guided, oh wow. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. Yeah. The summer curation is really just my own interest in what would I want to support my energy through the summer using the lens of Chinese medicine, but also using my understanding of movement because I'm a movement teacher. And so it's seven days. My goal was to make it a gentle entry point to ideally help people expand their awareness to their relationship to their own form and being. And so there's a day with breath and figuring out how to activate your center via my Pilates training. There's a day of meridian flossing where we're specifically working on the fire element meridians, the energy channels in your body that are contributing to the fire element and learning how to do the floss technique. And then the next three, no, next five days are kind of mixtures of that. So doing a longer floss practice. There's one day I think where we just do a meditation that's super open-ended. And I think a lot of people are pretty anxious about that one, which was fine by me because I think it's okay to not know. We balance the fire element in one day with water, which is the balance. So we restore and work on our kidneys and things like that. But yeah, it's a seven day introduction to my lens of Chinese medicine movement and being a human. So I had attended a yoga class and I felt with this internal critic, this, this striving for perfection, I'm not very fit. <laughs> and so when I was at this yoga class and there were instructions, do this and do that and follow the, the person who was doing it, even if she was giving us permission to modify, I was really angry at myself for not being able to do it beautifully or perfectly. And rather than really having this loving, warm, connected time with my body, I was, it served its purpose. It served this really revolutionary moment where I was like, wow, I have somewhat of a traditional father child relationship with my body. Oh, we have a fine relationship as long as you're abiding by my house rules. Yeah. So I was realizing that sure, maybe I had this love, love for my, my body or care, but it was only up to a certain point that it 
followed the rules or my expectations of it. As soon as it fell short of what I thought it was capable of or fell short of what I wanted it to do, I felt disgust. I felt, I don't know, like, yeah, anchored towards my, my body. And so I loved that about it. I think even some of the horrible things that happen, they serve a purpose, depending on what lens we look at it. And I realized that I did not have a un unconditional love for my, my body. It was not there. And that showed me what I could work on and what needed support. <laughs> so I loved that about it, but I was bringing that same kind of resistance to your seven day introduction. Yeah. But I will tell you for anyone who has similar resistance, they're going to love your seven day introduction huh. because <laughs> I was just so pleasantly surprised. I didn't feel sore afterwards. I didn't feel as though I was being asked to stretch myself beyond my body's ability. Because being that perfectionist, if you set this bar up here and I don't meet it, I'm going to be disgusted or disappointed with myself. So you used language that was even kind of outside the norm, mm. you used words like explore and play and things like that, that you don't necessarily hear in a traditional yoga practice. I liked that. And there was this one time, I think it was day two, I was talking about core. And I was like, oh gosh, day one was fine, <laughs> but I'm not going to do well with day two because I have no core strength. I had tried this as an adult a couple of years ago. I had tried this horse riding lesson and I had told the lady I have no core strength, but she didn't believe me <laughs> until afterwards we were in there and she's like, yeah, you need to hold your core here and push on the side of the horse here. And she's like, wow, you weren't kidding. <laughs> it's like, I mean, uh, yeah, I wasn't kidding. I have no core strength. <laughs> so anyway, I saw that that was in the title and I'm like, oh gosh, day one was just to get you lulled into this sense of <laughs> security. <laughs> and then she's going to rip us apart in day two. But no, it was, it was fine. It was gentle. I loved it. And in fact, there was this one part where you had us lift our leg and I loved this part where you said, or imagine lifting your leg. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I love this girl. <laughs> <laughs> She's my type of person. So anyway, I went in and tried this leg lift that could have been a little bit on the challenging side, but I loved that I had that permission to just imagine and then still get that same type of benefit of of raising my leg if I was able to do it. So it really, really did. And a lot of people say this, they try to meet you where you are, but I felt like your guided practice really did do that. Oh, that's so, I'm like, oh, I feel so good to hear that. Because when you were sharing about the yoga practice earlier, your resistance and how challenging it was, I've been thinking a lot about the the pendulum swings. And I think that at a point in time, having really fitness active yoga needed to happen for our community or something, but now I need to swing that pendulum way over to the other side so that we can find balance. And I just, I'm so big on needing to give permission for people to trust their body and trust where they're at and do less and take just have more space because it's otherwise this fancy repackaged distraction. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I love hearing that. When we were talking earlier about creating those spaces, those collective spaces to do nothing, mm -hmm. um, I have had one session of yoga nidra before. Do you have, mm -hmm. are you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if my experience is characteristic of all yoga nidra because I have just that one access point to it, but it was really fun in that it really did make me come to an internal space inside and deal with what wanted to be looked at at that moment was anger. And I, I didn't want to look at anger. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's what had come through in the yoga nidra was this anger. And we had a little tea party with this, this red genie type person that looked like Mr. Clean. And he just wanted to be witnessed and acknowledged. And so we had, we had tea together in my yoga nidra session. So I don't know, maybe I need to do more of that and find spaces and containers that it's less of the fitness part of it, which is good. I mean, if I, if I'm to that point where I can, where I'm fit enough to do that. (laughs) I remember what I was going to say now. And I think this is, this is another thing that's mattered a lot to me lately. I was listening to a different podcast with Florence Givens. She was interviewing these feminist twins. So I think everybody in our current society is up against the violence of comparison and needing to feel really competitive. And there's a lot of pressure to be the best in some way or to continue being really great and to objectify themselves. But I think that women tend to really be under that lens. So we have that going for us too. Just being a woman, in this podcast, they were describing how our experience, even within ourselves, is usually of watching ourselves from the outside, wondering how we might appear and appear to be appealing to anybody, to other women, to men. And then, so you mentioned self-love and that your self-love was conditional based on appealing to the father figure, the father archetype. And in this podcast, she said that there are days that she loves herself, but it's usually when she feels really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she's like, that's not self-love, that's self-objectification. And can you love yourself when you are even at your worst, which people like write memes and Instagram posts about that stuff. But I don't think that we take the time to sit with that and feel that. And that when you go into a class where you're moving your body next to all these other people who look so fit, who are probably perpetuating the same thing unconsciously, because they're also stuck with those same belief patterns or running through them below the surface, you're, you're up against so much just to just to love yourself. And so I'm interested in creating spaces that give you permission to be imperfect and to play and be kind of silly and just to slow down. And also, I honestly don't know if it's possible for me personally to truly love myself yet, but I'm just working on it. And I can only start by acknowledging that I objectify myself constantly to myself. (laughs) And I am creating more space to just be okay with that and observe it and sit with it. I can imagine what kind of pressure would be on an instructor because you're saying I am an expert of some sort. That's why you're coming to me is because I am here to guide you. So how much of a pressure is it on you as an instructor to kind of prove your stuff as opposed to okay, now you're here and we're just going to breathe. (laughs) Yeah, I think it shows up differently for a lot of different teachers. So I'll only speak for myself. As a young teacher, I was still a dancer. I had body image issues. I've had eating disorders. I've had a lot of challenges with my own body. I think when I first started teaching, I felt like to be a good teacher, I had to be able to do all the fancy poses. I felt like I needed to look thinner. There were a lot of pressures that I put on myself, I definitely wanted to demonstrate to people all the knowledge that I had because imposter syndrome. And now I do funny things. Like I, I really, I really mean this. I, I, this is important to me when I teach that I am not a teach. I'm, I'm a guide, maybe a leader. I know that I know my stuff. I've been teaching for 20 years. I, a forever student, I know so much and I'm still studying. But I don't have to prove that to anybody because the best way I believe that transformation occurs is when you create a safe space and permission for people to have their experience and not to get in the way. So the two things that I always fall back on are I don't hurt myself and I don't hurt other people. And that's, that's it. 
And then everything else that comes up is rich material to mine and explore together. I still lead shapes and poses, but to me, they're just shapes. And if a shape shows up and you're like, oh, I'm really bad at that. I feel so ashamed. That's something that you can step outside of yourself for a moment and recognize. It's like everything to me is a metaphor. Movements are metaphors. So it's just, it's just a way of exploring and playing that also involves your body. But I think that as a teacher, when I approach it that way, nobody trusts me in the beginning that, that I really mean it. I have one student who I just adore and she's been coming for years and she was like, I just didn't believe you when you were like, if you don't like what I'm teaching, you can do something else in class. She's like, I didn't believe that, but I realized it was my own conditioning and now she has a great time and she still hits that resistance and that disbelief because that's long conditioning and that's societal conditioning and that's, and that's okay. That's just what we're exploring when we're in the group. And then another thing before I forget, when you're a movement teacher, people just project that you're super healthy. They look at you and they're like, I bet you don't drink alcohol. I bet that you only eat vegetables or whatever. People have said a lot of Wait, that to me. Do you, do you meet those criteria? Because I would make those assumptions about you. Hell no. <laughs> no, I beat myself up with food and restrictions for too long in my youth. And I have a daughter. I'm not going to model behaviors like that for her. So I like to be as intuitive as possible. I have noticed that I don't love drinking alcohol anymore, but I don't judge it. I do still judge myself when I have a hangover because I can't drink alcohol anymore, but I still do it. I remember meeting a friend when I first moved to Austin and we went to a Pilates class together and then we went out for coffee and I ordered this massive cinnamon roll. I was like, what? Homie just wants a cinnamon roll. And she was like, that made me feel so much more comfortable. Like, oh, she eats a cinnamon roll, like she can hang. And I'm not saying if you like to eat healthy, that you should eat a cinnamon roll to make other people comfortable. Right. Absolutely not. But I think that there's a lot of pressure. I think I felt a lot of pressure as a, as a person, a teacher to me, that's what I heard. And I thought this made a lot of sense. A teacher is no different from other people, except that they're willing to have their process in public. Mm. And so you're like, Ooh, I better have my best process. Cause we're all trying to be our best selves, but that doesn't connect people. It just makes shame. So I just, I'm really interested in really being my authentic self as a human. Humans have base desires. Humans are pulled in lots of directions. I do try to make choices for, for the good of myself and the good of others and not to harm others, but the performative actions I'm less interested in as I've gotten older. <laughs> and you're so old. <laughs> I'm, I'm old. I'm old and wise and I give zero F-bombs <laughs> at my highest self. I still care a lot, but I try not to. <laughs> so yes, I took the quiz because I'm a sucker for quizzes and I didn't realize that there was going to be a seven day yoga thing. So I didn't have that resistance up to it yet. <laughs> I took the quiz and it was metal and I just read what it said about the metal element and it hit home. Can you just expound a little bit on the benefits of knowing what elements are more expressed or more dominant? Mm -hmm. How to, what are some simple things that you could do to, to help? Yeah. Well, I think the more we know ourselves, the more empowered we feel no matter what. So if you take the quiz and then you learn more about that element and it resonates with you, then it just gives you again, more anchors for how you're turning your attention and taking care of yourself in your life. But the elements again are like categories that have a whole bunch of other support techniques underneath of it. So like as a metal type, the two organs that are going to maybe mess with you the most would be your lungs and your large intestine. And so you could start looking at, have you had some challenges with that in the past? Asthma could be one. Also lungs processed grief. 
So again, it can get pretty complex pretty quickly because like it's everything. Holistic. Yeah. And, Human and design, that, astrology. Yeah. Well, and the thing I love is it doesn't isolate you from your environment. It places you in your environment. So you're looking at you in relationship to everything around you including the seasons. So like April, your season is going to be fall. Oh gosh. That's, that was another <laughs> aha moment. I took my quiz and I said, Hey, I, I got metal and it rang so true. Summer is not my favorite. I actually <laughs> love autumn. And I said, does that happen to be a correlation that all metals like autumn? <laughs> Just trying to put my curiosity out there at play. And you were like, indeed it there is a correlation. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. But it may also be there's yin and yang. So like all of this is ruled by the, the Tao, which is just light and dark balancing every light completes dark, dark completes light. And so you may find that if you're a metal type, autumn might be really hard for you. That might be the time that feels really irritating and hard because your metal might be out of balance or it might be the time that you feel most supported because that's your season. So you can just kind of look at it almost like a framework that you bounce your experience off of, see what rebounds back to you and what you want to do with it. Like I'm a fire type, fire element, also a Leo, which is interesting. But in the summertime, I'm like, oh, I have to be careful because there's a part of me that really wants that community and that support and that love. And I want that exchange. I want people to say how great I am and how great I make them feel. And then I get really, really burnt out. And I actually want to kind of retreat and hide. Mm. So knowing that about myself, I'm like, how can I structure my, my day or my time, my energy so that I can have the, the, the good, juju, but also make sure that I'm not pinning all of my needs onto that one category. How do I nourish myself? How do I restore? So it can be helpful too, if you take the quiz, once you get your results, if you go down to the bottom, all the other elements are there and you can read a description on all of the other elements, knowing that we contain all of them. Sometimes if your metal is out of balance, you may want to balance it with something like fire or wood or now I'm trying to remember the balancing no actually think about the feeding so the metal needs some earth which is the season that comes before it so earth feeds metal and then metal also moves into winter water so you can just start looking at these other elements and noticing which places you might feel you want to have more support with the metal, you were like, oh, I, I know that I need to be more with myself and be in stillness. That's actually a very water quality, but metal feeds water. So you can think of the precious minerals in the earth, the metal, that, that like fortifies water. So water provides the stillness that is potential energy and purpose. Purpose was another word you used a few times and water is associated with purpose. Because water feeds the growth of other things. So we contain all of them and, and there will be different times. There's microcosms and macrocosms. That's in the free guide that I put out. So you have your main type, but you also can think of these cycles playing out on smaller scales constantly. So within your own life, the idea of having a podcast and then launching it and getting to reap the benefits, the rewards of it, and then getting to a place of refining it and then coming back into reflection for how you want to emerge next time. That's the five elements in a cycle, but that didn't play out in your whole lifetime. That was a microcosm expressing the same thing. Or if you watch a plant, you'll see it go through all of those stages too. Yeah. When you were talking about your, your Leo placement, I was thinking about how, yes, we all we contain all five elements because I could still resonate with that because my, my North node is in Leo. And so I try to stretch into that sometimes of being visible and, but then I also find myself retracting, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love the whole idea of balance because I had Dana on the podcast last time and we were looking at another tool, the natal chart, mm. and I had some challenging aspects and they were opposing my ascendant is on one side and then my moon is along my descendant. And there's this struggle between how I show up in the world and my, in my inner experience 
and I feel like it's a tug of war. And she said, you could see it that way, or you could also see it just a call into balance. And so everything seems like lately, my mind's been trying to make it out to be a problem to be solved, et cetera. But it comes back to that, that yin and yang element. And let me just stop right there and say, it is pronounced yang. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If nothing else, Asia, I will be pronouncing it correctly from here on out. Okay. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. But yeah, this, this coming together, this balance, because I think before with the whole perfectionist thing and how I was raised, like there should only be light. Right. Everything else was not acceptable. And so I love you talking about how humans have base desires and all these things. And if we can temper that with, I don't want to harm myself and I will not harm others and finding wholeness within that, that meeting, that merging, it's just a lifelong journey, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that was another reason that Chinese medicine started to really resonate with me is because I think that my mind tends to want to simplify and vilify behaviors or things like, oh, I'm going to be bad and do this thing. But in Chinese medicine, your body is just constantly trying to create balance or harmony. And sometimes, like I was talking about the pendulum earlier, it's that you, your body is going to need to mount this big response because something else got way out of balance and it could look bad. Like, like, an immune response, getting sick, having a fever, but that's your body trying to recalibrate the imbalance that's happening. And so when I stopped thinking about things in terms of good and bad, and just looking at it more in terms of how is my body or how am I trying to create balance and what can I do to, to bring more homeostasis here, then it stopped feeling so shameful. And I stopped feeling like I was depriving myself. Yeah, I think in doing that, it's going to cause our brain to be more of a co-creative influence as opposed to leading the show, so to speak, because, yeah, it just goes back to if you have right and wrong or opposites, the, the brain just jumps on that because it's a problem to fix when when you're looking at it as a balance, there's not necessarily a problem because nothing's bad. It's just, mm -hmm. you need yeah. to. Yeah. It's like, how do I help? <laughs> yeah. So that brings in the brain's creativity and thoughtfulness and contemplation aspect, which are all very needed, but it takes away the problem solving in that there's nothing to fix because that's, my makeup. I just want to fix things. <laughs> but again, it's just exhausting to try and be like fixing everything, especially things that aren't, that aren't able to be fixed or aren't meant to be fixed. Like human beings, when you come back to, we're not fundamentally flawed, right? It's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. I think that comes back to teaching too, because I think at one point when I was a teacher, I was like, I am here to fix the people who have come to my class or they're here to fix themselves. And now I'm like, no, no, no. I'm here to give them space to recognize how incredible they are, how perfectly whole that they can be when they have permission to be with themselves without the expectations. I love that. <laughs> okay. So if you would just do a quick rundown as to the freebies that I can put in the show notes as far as the quiz and so forth that people can test for themselves to see what element and just kind of play with that. But before we do that, can you tell me how, how did you make your quiz? Did you just use your knowledge of the elements to come up with this stuff? Or did you ask people that you knew were predominantly fire elements. What is your idea of an ideal vacation? Cool. I wish I had done that. No, I, I did a lot of book reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was doing a lot of scholarly work, just books that I reference often. And then I started thinking of scenarios that 
that would really show what type people might be. And then that was how I created the quiz. Okay. Because there were several questions that I had to really think because some of them sounded so good. Like, wow, what do I do? <laughs> what if I answer wrong? Yeah. <laughs> <get> the wrong <laughs> result. <laughs> we have all sorts of types. I mean, my husband's taken it a few times. He gets different results, <laughs> even though I know he's metal, <laughs> but different things show up. And, and also with balance, it's like, I'm fire type, but when I was in ghost flower in the beginning, everybody thought I was wood because I saw that there was no structure at, at certain places. And so I had to be that type to satisfy that need. So it, it, it changes, although there is one type that you will probably resonate with most. I guess that brings up the question of, do other element types bring out more of a certain element in you? Because I really enjoy situations in which I'm allowed to be a certain expression of myself because if there is like this deficit or this need for say structure I will find myself fitting into that mold but I really appreciate those opportunities to be I don't know a little bit more carefree or where I don't have to be the structure or the mother type mm -hmm. or Maybe my own version of mothering, I guess, but what type would metal be drawn to? Would it be a water type then? Oh, be drawn to? I don't know. I think we find aspects in different, different things because my husband's metal and I'm fire. And I have a lot of metal in me also. I think he's metally and woody. And so that could be risky. Fire turns metal into other things. So that could be really hard on a metal person. And wood, wood feeds the fire, but if it goes the other way, the fire can get really frustrated with the, the structure of both metal and wood. So I think that partnerships really are more based in knowing yourself and knowing how you may support. What was helpful for me was knowing that my husband's, I, I identify, he's not that into all this typing stuff. He likes conventional science, but I think he's an Enneagram one and I think he's a metal type and that helps me understand him when he responds certain ways and knowing myself as a fire type, it helps me understand myself when I respond certain ways in the face of his way. So it yeah. all goes back to that self-awareness helping I us out. I think so. Yeah. It's, the, it's so important. I mean, what else can you have? Like you can't, you can't, make that for somebody else and you can't take it away from them. It's mm -hmm. true. All right. So if you would talk about the things that I'll be putting in the show notes for people to yes. click on. And I need, I need to send you some more of these links, but yes. Yeah, so there's an element type quiz and that's a great starting point. There's also a free PDF that is much deeper notes and processing about the summer curation, the element of summer. And in there are some free video links to some fascia flossing and some breathing and practices that you can just try. I will also give you a link to try Lindy Well for free 14 day trial if you wanna do some Pilates with me in the virtual community on demand. And then just check out my Instagram at Kate Amrazik because I put up reels and stuff all the time. And then my website is katamrazik.com. Even though you say your last name wrong, we'll forgive you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just, just mumble the last part and we'll be good. <laughs> well, that kind of takes care of the social presence segment. How can people find out more about you and follow what you're making in your own sandbox? So was there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I really do want people to message me. I was so glad to connect with you. I feel like sometimes social media, like there's a little connection, but there's more voyeurism. And I really put products out there to see how they feel. Like I'm here to be in service. So if you try my stuff, let me know, send me a DM, tag me so I know, send me an email. I, I'm available and really like to know. As a fire type, I want to know how it went for you. So please don't be a stranger. Have you found a, a helpful way of engaging people where it feels like more of a community or in, in a co-creation? I struggle with it too. I don't feel it as much on my social media, but in my classes, I feel it a lot in the Zoom class. So what was cool with my newsletter 
I didn't actually have a newsletter for a long time, but when I moved to Austin, I kept my California class, but just kept it on Zoom. And so most of the people I Zoom with every week are in California. And I was like, well, if I just see you over Zoom once a week, I don't have that same experience of before and after class, the chatting, the learning about your life. So I was like, I'm just going to make a letter that I send to you every week. And then that's a way that they can hit reply and talk with me. Also, it helps me package my thoughts for the class. So there's a theme, it, it leaves room for questions. And I think it just makes us feel more connected. And I think by doing it backwards like that, starting with in-person interaction and then creating this other piece of value that I'm hoping will mm. feed the experience. I mean, for what it's worth, I don't know, you probably track your open rates. I, my open rates hover at about 80%. And there's, there's high engagement in my emails, but I think it was because there was actually a real personal connection first, Right. but it's growing and it's continuing to go that way. So I think when I write something now, like I said, I put my process out in public, so I don't really know the answers. It's just what I'm thinking about for that week. And when I'm putting out my email, I'm thinking about the people that I want to touch. It's not how am I going to get these followers or how am I going to get this business to grow, but it's what is the question that I want us all to chew on this week? How will that enhance our time when we're together? So it helps me you, focus. You can tell a difference too, like when people do it from that point of view, or if there's a marketing thing to it, they feel like they have to get their two Instagram posts out that week or something. And because yeah, yeah there, there's certain accounts that it'll start off very personal, but I just know after I'm caught into it at the end will be this hook for them to help you in some way. And, and I definitely know that that's how we are trained to do things is create that personal element, but then you always feel had right at the end when, <laughs> yeah. when there's this obvious marketing hook at the, at the end. So I'm not trying to judge that. I'm just bringing that up because I know because of my reaction to that, that's informed how I want to do my own marketing. And I just don't have it perfected yet at all. Well, I know with holisticism, I met Michelle through a ghost flower event years ago. And then that was the first in-person connection I had to her. And then she was doing true in-person discovery phone calls with everybody. So I talked to her for like 40 minutes on the phone. She took time to talk to me about my business and my interests on the phone. And I think she did thousands of calls like that. And that was the start of holisticism and look at what it is now. And I think that it's, again, that violence of comparison where we see some people doing the marketing stuff with the hashtags and the things, and they're growing really fast because they're doing everything right for the industry as we see it. But if you have this, usually a more metally kind of, kind of way of being where you want it to feel more authentic and not just to be for the sales or something, you Metal want thing. that richness. It is, <laughs> in my opinion, that it, it's a slower growth probably, but also it's quality over quantity. That's a huge metal thing. So what you will be developing slowly is a much more dedicated community than maybe an influencer who's just putting out flashy content to get more likes and views. So I think it's recalibrating what our values are based on what our goals are. Well, I have enjoyed our conversation because from the outside, you are one of those influencers that looks so fit and has the great copy and all that stuff. On Wow. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I don't feel it's, that way. <laughs> I'm tempted to say it's nice to know you're a real person, but I know everybody's real. <laughs> Everyone's a real human being, but... I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you and that, yeah, you're, you're real, real and that you give everyone else permission to be their, their real selves as well. So thank you. I love how in the lifestylist podcast, Luke story ends his pods asking his guests this question. I love it so much that I include it in mine. 
Who have been three teachers or teachings in your life that you would share with our audience that they could go research and also learn from? Yeah, I love that question. And I think it changes all the time for me. But I think the three constants, my teacher, David Herwith, he's in Ojai. I take a class with him called Breathing. It's on Zoom and we breathe. And he walks you through all of his research on breathing. He has influenced me so greatly in how I hold space when I teach. I don't even know how to find him. I don't know if he's online, but search David Hurwitz. He's amazing. And his partner, Mira Love, who I first worked with at the UCSB dance department. Similarly, the way that she holds space, the way that she empowers and does her own research, there's a depth to both of them that I have not found in a lot of teachers and an authenticity that I just so gravitate towards to the point where they make me feel like I'm their equal, even though I make them my teachers, but they are, they, that's that, that humility and, and authenticity that I just so admire. So Mira Love and David Hurwitz. And then my third answer is the studio where I came from, Yoga Soup. It's in Santa Barbara, California. They have online classes, including one with me, so you can take mine. But the owner and the manager are such inspirations, but I feel like Yoga Soup, as it stands, what it represents is a teacher. It's just this beautiful space for healing. I've gone to a lot of studios in my life. I've never found one like Yoga Soup. So before I say the closing lines, was there anything that you wanted to say or emphasize or reflect on? I think this has been a really great conversation. It's, it's such a treat to meet you and spend time going into these deeper places. And I, I just really appreciated it. So grateful for you to have me on your podcast. Well, it's been my pleasure. I want to thank you, Keita, so much for joining me in Sheffy's Sandbox, sponsored by our bat animal spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and I will definitely be seeing you in a holisticism hub. So much love to you. You too.